<laughs> to the Draper Museum of Natural History's Lunchtime Expedition Series. And I, I guess I, I can actually do this now. You know, we're in the midst of a name change, so I can, I can be the first. Right, Bonnie? Yes. It's official? I can do yeah, this? Okay. Uh, I can officially welcome you on behalf of the Draper Natural History Museum of the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. So you're privileged to hear that officially for the first time, even though the real rollout will occur on the May 8th. <laughs> That'll be enough from the front row here. I heard that. Um, but it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to have you here today. Uh, boy, we've got lots going on in May and, and heading into the uh, end of June uh, this year. I, uh, um, <laughs> the weather just this last week reminds me that springtime in the Rockies is a lot like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> so we're pleased. I was worried yesterday if Lisa would uh, actually be able to get, get here from there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but uh, uh, made it today without any trouble. So without any further ado, oh, first of all, because Bonnie would throw something at me if I didn't, boy, she reminds me back there. Please do turn your cell phones off. Um, remember to do that. We hate to have a phone call in the middle of the presentation, right? Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, let me uh, introduce, I, I first met our speaker today just a, just a couple of years ago. Um, I think we met at a Raptor Research Foundation meeting um, in uh, Fort Collins a few years ago. In fact, there was a big Golden Eagle meeting at that time, and, and that's why I was there. But uh, um, Doug Smith, whom many of you know, the uh, Wolf Project leader and wears many other hats in Yellowstone. He's also head of the uh, ornithology program now and at, uh, uh, in Yellowstone National Park, introduced uh, uh, our speaker and I together at, at that time. Um, and uh, since then, uh, I've had the pleasure of really working with her and some other groups with the Yellowstone Raptor Initiative uh, and gotten to know her and, and uh, what great work that they're doing up there. So let me tell you a little bit about her. She began her career as an ornithologist uh, in about 2000, banding songbirds in Yosemite National Park. Uh, her work has taken her to places like Fort Hood, Texas, uh, which, and if you know Fort Hood, Texas, actually, it's, it sounds like Fort Hood, Texas, it, it's a pretty pretty neat spot, especially for, for birding and, and wildlife. Uh, and she re researched the nesting biology of the uh, uh, endangered, actually, um, golden cheek warblers there. And she was in Maui, Hawaii, where she was part of the team responsible for capturing the last of the, wi of the, of the wild po'o'uli. <laughs> did I get that right? It, was, I, it is a tricky one, I remember, but I've seen those guys. Honey creepers. Uh, for a captive breeding program there. Uh, after completing her degree in 2009, she began working for Yellowstone for the Yellowstone Bird Program, where she's focused on peregrine falcon, trumpeter swan, and bald, bald eagle monitoring primarily, although she's been doing some other things. So please welcome Lisa Burrell. <laughs> Can't get the green. Can you guys hear me? Is that all? I think it might be from there. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chuck, for that introduction. Um, today I'll be talking to you about uh, the implications of cutthroat trout declines for breeding ospreys and bald eagles at Yellowstone Lake. This was a study initiated a couple of years ago between the Yellowstone Bird Program and the Yellowstone Fisheries Program. Um, and also with uh, Tom Drummer of Michigan Technological University. Um, I am a biologist and I like to be out there watching behavior. Um, and so I don't really enjoy the number crunching so much, but it's necessary, part of our, uh, my job. So uh, we contracted uh, Tom Drummer to help us with all that number crunching stuff and he's really good at it. <laughs> so I'll try to keep all those numbers to a minimum in this talk. There we go. <laughs> uh, so I'm sure many of you have already you know, have been to Yellowstone Lake numerous times, um, but just a quick overview. It's in the southeast corner of Yellowstone. It's one of the highest, if not the highest, uh, large elevation lake in North America. There is about 130, squ it's 130 square miles in area, so it's huge. Um, and about 150 uh, miles of forested shoreline. And the only reason I mention that is because that's the nesting habitat of bald eagles and ospreys. Um, there are also several small islands, uh, Stevenson Island and Frank Island, that uh, bald eagles and ospreys like to nest on. So just a picture. There's the uh, 
Lake Hotel. Let's see if I can do this right here. Uh, Stevenson Island and Frank Island out here. Um, beautiful place to spend an afternoon, really, really special. Although right now it's completely frozen and I don't recommend, well, it's, it's still cool to see it frozen, so I do recommend you actually go there, but if you go there now, I would also recommend going in late June when it looks like this. <laughs> so I'll start talking about fish first, um, because cutthroat trout are really the key, predator, uh, key prey species of the Yellowstone Lake ecosystem. Um, there are about 40 species of wildlife associated with cutthroat trout, Yellowstone Lake. Um, about 20 species are strongly associated with cutthroat trout and really rely on them as a food source. 15 of those are birds. So birds really rely on cutthroat trout in the Yellowstone Lake ecosystem. Um, American white pelicans, Caspian terns, uh, common loons, gulls, double-crested cormorants, and of course, bald eagles and ospreys. But probably for the last 20, 30 years or so, cutthroat trout has been declining at Yellowstone Lake. Many of you know about this issue already. Um, there are several factors why Yellowstone cutthroat trout have been declining. The first is whirling disease. Whirling disease was introduced to the lake ecosystem in 1998, and it's Luckily for us, it's localized primarily to the Pelican Creek drainage area and a couple other places at Yellowstone Lake, but it's a neurological parasite. It affects the behavior of fish and it causes them to whirl around, hence the name. Um, and because of that whirling, they're unable to feed and many of them die of starvation. Um, and it also it really attracts predators, so they're more vulnerable to predation when they have whirling disease. Um, so that is definitely an issue that is affecting lake trout, or affecting cutthroat trout, excuse me. Um, drought is also another issue in drought years. Um, the tributaries that are connected to Yellowstone Lake may be cut off. Cutthroat trout, many of them will spawn in the lake, but a lot of them go up to tributary streams in spring. And if they're cut off, they may not be able to get to those areas. But probably the biggest factor affecting cutthroat trout is lake trout. Lake trout were introduced in the late 1980s, probably from Lewis Lake. And they've since expanded their population enormously. Um, in 1994, they were first discovered. Someone you know, was fishing in Yellowstone Lake and pulled out the first lake trout. And that was a big surprise to the Yellowstone Fisheries Program. And they immediately began a campaign to remove as many lake trout as possible from the Yellowstone Lake. So Yellowstone uh, lake trout are a significant predator on cutthroat trout. <coughs> an average sized lake trout can consume about 40 cutthroat trout in a year, and that doesn't seem like a lot, but considering in 2007 the fisheries program removed 72,000 lake trout, that equals about 3 million cutthroat trout that those, that those lake trout could have consumed. Just the ones that were removed from the lake, never mind all of the lake trout that are still in the lake. So it's causing a substantial um, causing substantial declines in the cutthroat trout population. So from an ecological perspective, one might ask, you know, I mean, as a biologist, I want to see native species there, but one might ask, okay, well, can lake trout be an ecological equivalent to cutthroat trout? Um, and the answer to that question is no. Uh, and there are several reasons for this. One is that lake trout occupy really deep waters in Yellowstone Lake. Um, and that's pretty much out of the reach of all of these terrestrial predators. So loons, for example, can dive down pretty deep and may be able to catch some of them. Um, but species like ospreys and bald eagles that are foraging in that upper few feet of the water column aren't able to access lake trout. Same thing with grizzly bears. Um, they're you know, foraging in that upper water column and um, along the shores and streams, and so they're not able to get those lake trout. Second is that lake trout don't spawn in the tributary streams like cutthroat trout do, they actually spawn in the lake. So they're not traveling up those streams and aren't accessible to any predator that might be traveling along those streams. Um, lake trout are long lived. There was a 33 plus pound lake trout removed just this past fall. It's the biggest lake trout removed from Yellowstone Lake since netting began for them in 1994. Um, it totally, it tipped the scales. I think the scale only went up to 33 pounds and it actually um, was above that. And so that's a, that's a fish that probably, they have indeterminate growth, which means they keep growing no matter how 
um, long may live. So that was a, um, an animal that may have been one of the first introduced into Yellowstone Lake in the late 1980s. Um, so there's some pretty big fish out there. So this is a problem for bald eagles and ospreys, potentially. Um, about 50% of bald eagles and ospreys in Yellowstone have nested and foraged at Yellowstone Lake. Um, it represents a, a core nesting habitat for those two species. Ospreys um, are obligate consumers of fish. 99% of their diet is made up of cutthroat trout. They may catch a salamander or a frog every once in a while, but for the most part, they're strictly consumers of fish. Um, bald eagles, on the other hand, have a much wider diet breadth. About 30% of their diet is fish in the Yellowstone Lake ecosystem. In other places, like maybe southeast Alaska, they're eating a lot more, maybe 80 to 90% fish, but in this system, there's a lot of other things to feed on, like ducks during the early season as the ice is breaking up. Ducks are really concentrated to a few open areas. So they're feeding on them. And then, of course, in the fall, they're feeding on a lot of ducks um, when they're going through the molting period. Um, there's a lot of uh, carrion on the landscape from winter kills and wolf kills that they're able to utilize. Um, but 30% of their diet is made up of fish. And that suggests that maybe declines in cutthroat trout could be affecting their reproduction. So we had a couple of objectives. The first was just to figure out what the trends in um, bald eagle and osprey reproduction is. Um, we surveyed from 1987 to 2009 uh, for both bald eagles and ospreys. Um, we have some data that goes back to the 70s for ospreys. And actually, we have some nest sites that have been monitored since 1930. Um, so a long-term data set. But Data was really uh, collected annually since 1987. So that's where we began. Um, and then we wanted to figure out if there's a relationship between these cutthroat trout declines and measures of raptor reproduction. So we were looking at the number of breeding pairs, um, nesting success, which is the percent of nests that are successful, and um, productivity, which is the average number of young fledged per nesting pair. Uh, we also looked at weather because in any system, weather is going to you know, potentially affect nesting success. And cold, wet springs may be worse than warm or dry springs. Of course, Yellowstone, it's always a cold, wet spring. So I'll say colder, wetter springs. <laughs> so we surveyed for bald eagles and ospreys using a fixed wing airplane. Um, we flew the perimeter of the whole lake searching for nests. And when we found one, we monitored it through fledging or failure, whichever came first. Um, bald eagles nest earlier, so we started surveys for them in April and went through June. That's when they start fledging. And then May through August for ospreys. Um, and cutthroat trout data was collected by the Yellowstone Fisheries Program. They have 11 sites set up, well distributed throughout Yellowstone Lake. They do it for one day in the fall before lake turnover. Um, and this is sort of an index to the uh, cutthroat trout population. It's not the actual size of the cutthroat trout population, but it gives us an idea of how big it is. Um, and so then we wanted to marry those two variables, and the reproductive variables and the cutthroat trout to see if cutthroat trout may be influencing raptor reproduction. So this is just a plot of the data. Um, ospreys, you can see, are much more numerous than bald eagles at Yellowstone Lake. During the early part of the time period, there was a lot of fluctuation, and they were up and down. Um, you know, a low of maybe 25 nests um, to a high of 62 at its peak. Um, but overall, there were maybe between, you know, about 40 nests during that earlier time period. And so the population was relatively stable. We expect to have year-to-year -year variation. That's pretty normal in a population. Um, what's interesting, though, is after 2001, the population really plummeted. And you can see just, like, decreased to three, four nests at Yellowstone Lake. Right now, we have about five pairs of ospreys that are nesting at Yellowstone Lake, whereas there was, were 62 at its peak. Um, so a substantial decline. We see the opposite trend for bald eagles. Bald eagles actually started out at about eight to 10 pairs um, and doubled in size. Um, it's hard to see the doubling because there's so many ospreys, so we have to make that access really long. Um, but there were about eight to 10 pairs, and then it went up to about 16 to 20 pairs um, by about 2000, 2001. Um, and we think the reason for the increase in breeding uh, bald eagles was because this was following the DDT era. 
um, DDT banned in 72, I think, and sometime in the 70s, put on the uh, endangered species list and a lot of recovery efforts to bring that species back. So we think that you know, they were doing, starting to do well during that time period and dispersing across the landscape, and some of them dispersed into Yellowstone. When we look at nesting success, the percent of nests that fledged at least one young, again, there's a lot of variability. Ospreys are the solid line. Um, but about 1998, the population really began declining substantially. Um, there were no successful nests in 2008 or 2009. So there were only three to four pairs on the lake, but none of those were successful. For bald eagles, we see also a declining trend, but it's not as substantial as that of ospreys. Um, there's still some successful nests, averaging around 30 at the lower end of that, at the later end of that time period, and um, I don't know about 50, 50 percent during the earlier part of that time period. So there were, still were declines, but they still were hanging on there. Productivity. The number, uh, average number of young fledged per uh, breeding pair declined for both species. And of course, if there are no successful nests for ospreys, they're going to produce no young. So the last couple of years, um, there have been no young produced from any of the nests um, at Yellowstone Lake. OK, so before I get into the whole uh, marriage between cutthroat trout, weather, and uh, these reproductive variables we just looked at, I just want to talk a little bit about correlations. It'll be Quick and dirty, I promise. Um, but when we look at, uh, look at these two measures, we plot the data, and we try to fit um, the, an average line through it. And those points, when they fall around an average line, tells us something about the relationship between the two. So if they're an equal number above and an equal number below, the line is pretty flat and horizontal. There's pretty much no relationship there. It doesn't matter what's on the bottom axis. Um, because the top axis will just change randomly. Um, now, the bottom one is, uh, indicates a strong relationship between two variables. So the average line, the points are really tight against that average line. And um, it indicates that there's a strong relationship. So that strong relationship could go positive. So for every increase in one variable, there's an increase in another. Or it can be a negative rela relationship, where there's an increase in one and a decline in the other. We measure that with an R value, a uh, correlation coefficient. So it varies between negative 1 and 1. Um, and basically, the closer it is to negative 1 or 1, the stronger the relationship it is. The closer to 0, the less uh, strong relationship it is. Um, so when we look at cutthroat trout and osprey breeding pairs, we see a pretty strong relationship between the two. There's a really strong association there, that top figure, um, as the number of cutthroat trout increases in the park, in the Yellowstone Lake, the number of breeding pairs also increases. And that R value is about 0.7. So there's a strong relationship there. And that makes intuitive sense. Ospreys are feeding almost exclusively on cutthroat trout. So it would stand to reason that if there's more <coughs> cutthroat trout there, there might be more breeding pairs there. When we looked at productivity, uh, we found also a strong relationship that if there are more cutthroat trout, then they're more likely to fledge young, more likely to produce young. For bald eagles, we found actually the opposite relationship, um, where the more cutthroat trout there were, the less, the fewer breeding pairs there were. And we think that this is um, that cutthroat trout haven't caused, in, you know, in, uh, a decline in or an increase in uh, breeding pairs of ospreys. I think it's more of just they, they the uh, bald eagles were recovering from um, endangerment, and so. After the recovery efforts, they were able to increase at Yellowstone Lake, despite the fact that there were fewer cutthroat trout in the lake, because they're able to utilize other resources like ducks. Um, but we did find, though, that there was a relationship between productivity and cutthroat trout. So the um, more cutthroat trout there were, the better able they were to reproduce. Um, so we looked at weather variables as well. And precipitation, it didn't really matter. So it didn't matter if it was a really wet spring or a really dry spring. Um, there were the same number of breeding pairs of ospreys. And it didn't matter for reproduction um, what the precipitation was. Temperature had somewhat of a, an effect for osprey productivity. So really um, cold, cold springs 
um, influenced productivity and it lessened you know, the amount of young that they were able to produce. Um, bald eagles, we found a weak positive relationship, but um, it wasn't significant. So for ospreys, all the reproductive variables declined. Um, it suggests that um, there's not competition between breeding pairs of ospreys, because what you'd expect if they're competing with each other, there's lots of ospreys breeding um, on the lake, that productivity would decline. And what we saw was that as there were fewer and fewer breeding pairs, productivity also declined. So probably not competing much with each other. Um, these declines are definitely associated with declines in cutthroat trout numbers and to some extent colder temperatures. Um, and then for bald eagles, breeding pairs actually increased while productivity and nesting success declined. And that indicates that there might have been some competition between bald eagles. Um, So the relationship between cutthroat trout and bald eagles is less clear, and that makes sense because bald eagles are um, eating a lot of other things, and maybe you know their diet now is made up of le fewer cutthroat trout and more ducks on the landscape. We would need to go out and um, research that. We don't have any information on what they're eating now if they've switched to another prey resource. Um, so this is good news for bald eagles, although the nesting success and productivity have declined, it may be a result of the number of uh, breeding pairs on the lake. So what's being done, this is the 33 pound plus cut uh, lake trout that was caught last fall. Um, so as I said, the lake trout program has been in place since 1994. Um, more than a million lake trout have been removed by the Yellowstone Fisheries Program, and they're getting better and better at it every year. They're able to figure out where lake trout are spawning, um, figure out where they're hanging out at the different times of the season, depending on water temperature, and really keying in on those areas and trying to remove as many lake trout as possible. Um, so 302,000 were removed just last year. Um, so that's a substantial number. Um, they're doing a great job. Um, I've thought a lot about, you know, what can be done from the bird perspective um, and, you know, there's really not much. This is really a lake trout, cutthroat trout issue. Um, there are lots and lots of nests on Yellowstone Lake and many of them are empty. Um, so it's not, you know, a question of is there just uh, not as much nesting habitat as there used to be because of fires or trees falling down. It's, um, these nests are still there, just they're not being occupied like they once were. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, Yellowstone's ornithologist, Terry McEnany, who collected most of this information from 1987 to 2007. Um, and of course our pilots, Roger Stradley and Steve Ard, who always piloted us safely and were really good observers as well. Um, and then the multiple field technicians who contributed to this work. Um, we got funding from the National Park Service and Yellowstone Park Foundation, which um, is a substantial contributor to uh, many Yellowstone projects. Um, so with that, I'll take some questions. No, the lake trout, the Yellowstone has a long history of non-native fish introductions. Um, lake trout were uh, intentionally put into uh, Lewis Lake and Heart Lakes. And Heart Lake is actually closer to Yellowstone Lake, but they've done all this research on the fish and determined that it came from, from chemical markers, that it probably came from Lewis Lake, that someone took a fish from that lake and dumped it into Yellowstone Lake. I think at one point there was an introduction, a, a, sanctioned introduction of lake trout into Yellowstone Lake, but it didn't take. Um, this was way back when, in the early 1900s. A lot, you know, and I don't think many people knew this, and I was really surprised by it um, when I first started researching this, but almost half of Yellowstone's waters were fishless. There weren't any fish there. And, um, and now we've got brown trout, brook trout, rainbow trout, rainbow cuts. 
um, lots, you know, lots and lots of different fish in many of these streams. And there are ospreys all over the park, and bald eagles all over the park. And they probably wouldn't be nesting in some of these areas if they hadn't introduced those fish. So it's kind of, it's kind of interesting to think about, you know, that we're losing ospreys from Yellowstone Lake, the native fishery, one of the best native fisheries in the country. Um, and, but ospreys are doing really well in the rest of the park feeding off of all these non-native fish because they don't care what species they're feeding off of. They just want what's ever available. So. This was an, I'm assuming not an official. It was official. There was a, there was a, a commission that was, that was stationed in the park and they had hatcheries all over the park. And um, they collected eggs and fry from a lot of, uh, from Yellowstone Lake and distributed them all over the country for cutthroat trout. Including, yeah. Including lake trout? Um, and that lake trout came from elsewhere. And I don't know where the original lake trout stock to Yellowstone came from, you know, where the Lewis Lake fish came from. I'm not sure about that, but it came from, you know, I guess n lake trout are more northerly species up in Canada and maybe a little bit in the northeast. Um, and it, you know, from one of those places, someone brought lake trout here, and it was it was all sanctioned. They thought they were improving the environment. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So the um, the introduction from Lewis Lake to Yellowstone Lake was not sanctioned. No, that was an accident. We don't know how that happened, but it was not intentional. The lake trout that are caught, the gill, the air bladder is cut and they're thrown back into the lake. That's to keep resources within the lake. And I mean, there's just, you know, a million lake trout to deal with and 302,000 last year. So it's a lot. So um, they're thrown, they're killed and they're thrown back into the lake. Yes. Are they primarily removing the lake trout with netting and doing so are they inadvertently getting cutthroat? Oh, that's a great question. Um, they try really hard not to get cutthroat trout, and they're really good at not getting them. They um, set nets at specific depths that cutthroat trout generally don't hang out, and that lake trout hang out. They also vary the mesh size so that cutthroat trout can swim through, and they get those bigger lake trout. There, of course, is some bycatch, though, but it's, it's very, uh, it's minimal. Yes? Several years ago, Um, are you referring to the whirling disease or with worms? I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. I'm not certain. You know, I haven't heard of that being an issue. The, the primary factors, that, you know, the, the primary disease is whirling disease right now. Um, so I'm not sure about worms, but there is a like, um, I think the parasite has to infect a worm, which then infects the fish. So that may be what you're referring to. And if that's the case, then yes, whirling disease is causing declines in cutthroat trout. And it is still a problem. Yes. Do y'all raise cutthroats in the hatchery and turn them loose? Um, I know that they're doing some work with grayling and uh, at some of the fisheries and releasing releasing them and they are re-releasing cutthroat trout um, into some other streams but I don't I'm gonna get myself into trouble if I talk too much about it <laughs> so I, I'll stop there because I'm not exactly sure but I know that the fisheries program is doing a lot of work to restore to um, take out some of the non-native fish to some of these streams and lakes and to replace them with native fish and they are getting those uh, from a hatchery I think near Bozeman <coughs> talked about continuing declines since 2007 with Osprey. Is that based on continuing studies beyond this, or is that more anecdotal? And secondly, could you expand on what you said at the end about Osprey moving to other parts of the park? Sounds like the breeding productivity in other areas is actually going up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we monitor Ospreys and uh, bald eagles annually every year. Just this particular study ended then, but we are continuing to monitor them. Um, right now we have five pairs of ospreys that nest on the lake. And uh, for the first time, one was successful last year, but just one of them. So um, 
We're starting to see an increase in cutthroat trout. Uh, it's a very minimal increase, but there have been a few years of increases, and hopefully that trend will continue, and that they think that that's a response to all the removals of lake trout. They're never gonna remove all the lake trout, but just to suppress them to the point where cutthroat trout can come back. Um, and elsewhere in the park, uh, you wanted to know about the productivity. But what is happening with osprey elsewhere in the park? It sounded from what you said at the end that the population is actually increasing, that they have uh, been successful in adapting to moving to streams uh, elsewhere in the park and are successful in breeding. Yeah, well, um, Ospreys in the rest of the park, we monitor probably about 25 to 30 pair in the rest of the park. And they're maybe 60, 50% of them are successful annually. And that's a pretty stable population. It's not that they're expanding or declining. They're stable. Mm -hmm. Yes? You said earlier that there was a uh, sanctioned introduction of lake trout at the turn of the century to the Yellowstone mm -hmm. Lake, but it wasn't successful. That's right. Um, so you're asking, what would a change in that time period make this accidental lunch fish coming into the lake successful? Oh, that's a great, that's a, that's a really good question, and I don't know the answer to that. I don't know, because I think that if they w really wanted lake trout in there, and it went during the sanctioned um, introductions, that they would have put a lot in there. How did they know that failed? Um, because, well, that's a great question, too, because they'd never caught any other lake trout um, after that time period. And I think that's how they judged whether it failed or not. I mean, there's no way to know for sure, um, but from, the collection from the, uh, there was a study done several years back to try to figure out when, uh, how old, you know, when these first lake trout came into the lake and they determined that it was um, the late 1980s and that there were no uh, fish that would have come earlier than that. But I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. So there's no possibility that these fish that are there now came from the original area that was there, the original stock where they just were suppressed to the point where they were so low in numbers they couldn't be found. And yeah, I think, yeah, that's, that's the thought, is that, yeah, that they weren't successful and that it wasn't until this re more recent introduction that they became successful. And I think that they would have known it beforehand because lake trout are just, they are so predacious that they would have noticed them, you know, they would have, I mean, cutthroat trout numbered in the millions in Yellowstone Lake, and I think that they would have uh, expanded their population so rapidly that they would have been detected much earlier and uh, they weren't detected until 94. Yes. How many do you have for people would possibly migrate following food storage outside of the Yellowstone ecosystem? Um, I know as a fact we have a nesting pair east of the dam of Osprey that continues to nest in there the rest of the year. Uh -huh. So is, are you asking in response to the declines in cutthroat trout, will they move elsewhere? Yeah, I, oh, I, I bet they do. I, you know, they're going to go wherever the food is. And the food's not at, at Yellowstone Lake right now. So they're dispersing elsewhere. And that's why we don't have, an, you know, we have so few breeding pairs. Yeah. Uh, only five, whereas at one time there were, you know, 62. That was the high number. Um, yeah, uh, so they're definitely going to go where the food is and might disperse to other areas in search of that. Mm -hmm. They just won't come back to the Yellowstone Lake. Yes? Oh, no. Oh, yes. This is just applying to Yellowstone Lake areas, not even applying to the whole park. Just Yellowstone Lake I'm talking about. The rest of the population in Yellowstone Park is doing pretty well. They're stable. Um, it's the Yellowstone Lake population that's declining. Mm -hmm. Ospreys, I think, are doing pretty well uh, nationwide. Yes? Um, are lake trout only predatory for cutthroat, or do they eat all of They'll eat each other. <laughs> they'll eat smaller lake trout. Uh, they'll eat whatever's available and they can consume given their body size. Um, it just happens to be that cutthroat trout are the most prevalent. I'm sure that they're e eating a lot of their, uh, their own species. Um, the interesting thing about Yellowstone Lake is there aren't that many other, like cutthroat trout is, uh, is the, the dominant fish in that system. So there are other non-native and native species, long-nosed dace and you know some other really tiny species that are that are relegated to certain areas of the lake. They're not well distributed, and um, they're not as numerous as cutthroat trout. So 
as an alternative prey source for lake trout or even eagles or ospreys, none of those other species um, fit the bill like cutthroat trout do. Uh, just kind of to comment on that, what that one fellow was asking that, you know, in Yellowstone Lake, uh, there really couldn't have been any viable lake trout population in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. I think those were introduced in the 20s. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there was extensive fishing, and, mm -hmm. and it was before catch and release, and there was just a lot of folks fishing on the lake that never caught a lake trout. So, and I was the Heart Lake Ranger for many years, and, uh, you know, it, it pretty much would catch lake trout and cut trout. So mm -hmm. there were really a viable population, you know, that would have been known. So there was, yeah. I think, you know, the school of thought that they were introduced about, you know, in the 80s or early 90s. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. 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 with the, uh, you know, the scale uh, analysis that, you know, they pretty much correlate with the uh, most late fish, so. Yes, um, exactly, I yeah. I think really any doubt that that's what happened. Yeah, exactly, if you look at um, the figure of cutthroat trout is up and down, and then as just a few years after, we can go back to the, oh. okay, so yeah, I mean, the declines happened, um, I, we, we don't have information from before this, but they really started, I mean, there was decline those first years, I don't know if you really call that a decline, a couple of years, and then up, and then down, and then up again, but the declines really started happening post-1998. Um, so, you know, it would take a little bit of time for the lake trout to really take a hold and then start to having a substantial visible effect on the cutthroat trout. But you bring a, up a good point that there was a lot of fishing activity in, in um, Yellowstone Lake and before catch and release, and that caused some declines in cutthroat trout at that time period too. But they had recovered by the time um, this study had been done. Yeah, so somebody yeah. would have caught a lake trout. Yeah, somebody, somebody would have caught one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, that's a great question. I, um, the thought is from the fisheries folks that the population at Hart Lake and Lewis Lakes have sort of stabilized, that they've went through their major decline in cutthroat trout. And uh, they were never gonna be totally eliminated, but they're probably substantially lower than they once were. Um, and they're gonna remain at that low level under predation pressure by lake trout. So both of them can coexist now, but the cutthroat trout are just going to be at a much lower level than if the lake trout weren't there. What other species of fish are in that lake, the entire lake? Area? In Yellowstone Lake? Yeah. Oh, there's long nosed dace and lake chub and um, a variety of other species that I can't name right now, but um, I don't think that the fisheries is really tracking them at all. So they're not sure, yeah, to my knowledge. What's yeah. the relationship, if any, between bald eagles and osprey as far as competition? And rise of the eagles explain part of the decline in the autumn. Okay, that's a good question, and I forgot to mention, we actually did look at that, because that's a totally fair question, and you might think that increasing number of bald eagles might displace some of the ospreys. We did not find evidence that there was any competition between the two. We looked at it both ways, and uh, you know, if bald eagles were out competing ospreys or ospreys were out competing bald eagles just to cover all the bases. We didn't find any evidence of it. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. We just didn't find it, given our data. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's the goal of the Park Service? Are they trying to eliminate the lake trout, or are they going to carry it to a certain level? I think that they would love to eliminate the lake trout, but I don't think that it's feasible. Um, and I, that's not their goal. To my understanding, their goal is really to suppress lake trout numbers enough so that cutthroat trout can come back. And they, cutthroat trout may never come back to the numbers that they once were in the uh, early 80s, 70s. Um, but the goal is just to suppress those lake trout so that cutthroat trout aren't as you know, declining like they are now. Um, it's such a huge, huge lake, 130 square miles. 60 meters deep or deeper in place, it's really a huge lake. And so, you know, 
panels and have gotten together. You know, they've had multiple conventions and uh, discussions and commissions about what to do about the lake trout issue. And the only thing that can really be done is to keep continue targeting lake trout and to get better and better information about where they're hanging out so they can um, kill more of them. But it's they're probably always it will there will be a population of lake trout in Yellowstone Lake. So they'll keep suppressing them. For they'll keep suppressing them. It's right now in, you know an indefinite suppression. I don't know how well you know how long that can be sustained. It's very expensive. <laughs> very expensive. Time for just two more questions. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. No, I think the lake trout are eating live fish, um, so they're not, you know, going to be consuming that dead matter. But it's, yeah. I mean, it's it's a lot of detritus being dumped back into the lake. And the thought is, I mean, it's partially, well, what do we do with all these fish, you know? And the easiest solution is to dump them back into the lake. I don't know what kind of effect that might be having. Um, there's a lot of, you know, now decomposing dead matter at the bottom of the lake. Um, that, you know, I'm sure lots of things are feeding off of that and bacteria and a number of other things. But um, yeah, as far as, yeah, I don't know, you know, any beyond that, what effect that might be having. And I'm not sure that if they're looking at that or not. But I know that they've really thoroughly explored all angles of their management program um, because they want to do what's best for the Yellowstone Lake ecosystem. So. You know, I'd have to ask them, you know, specifically whether they've thought of that and what, what you know, their conclusion was, but I'm not sure right now. Yes? Are you aware of any other population studies similar to the ones you're doing uh, for other species that are dependent on the cut crop, specifically great blue heron and pelican population? There, in, at least in Yellowstone, there are, you know, we're not, there are no other studies, but we've thought about it for, um, None, there aren't that, there are definite populations of great blue heron in the park. Um, there aren't any rookeries on Yellowstone Lake, to our knowledge. Um, but there are a lot of uh, pelicans and some Caspian terns, although their population is declining, and lots of double-crested cormorants who nest on the Molly Islands in Yellowstone <coughs> Lake. And um, we've, we see a tremendous amount of variability in their population. Um, it's up and down. And it has a lot to do with lake water level because they nest on these really small, like half acre in size islands. And they're just pieces of sand, you know, they're just sand spits basically. And um, so a lot of nests get flooded that way. So there's a tremendous amount of variability. And we think it has most, mo is mostly attributed to weather um, and just lake water levels. But, you know, I can see that they may be affected as well. Um, a lot of the pelicans and cormorants will go to the Yellowstone River and forage there instead of the lake. Lisa, thank you very much and thank all of you. And a lot of your questions, of course, are on the Yellowstone fishery and Yellowstone Lake fishery specifically. And, and uh, I, you'll be happy to know that I'm already, I've already booked for next year uh, a couple of fisheries biologists come talk specifically about the uh, Yellowstone cutthroat trout and, and lake trout uh, uh, issue too. So they may be able to answer some of the questions that are, that, and they may not be able to because there's a lot of no. But thank you again for, uh, uh, for attending. We'll see you in June. Thank you. Bye-bye.